Um, so uh, thank you all for coming out on a, a Saturday. And I think uh, the presentations that we all just saw were indications of like great work that, that people have come together and really worked on problems that they saw in their communities. Um, let's see. So uh, one of the things about Google is that we've had a mission for, as a company from the very beginning that I think is very broad and timeless. Organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And one of the great things about that is um, there's lots of different ways that you can try to do that. And we're never fully satisfied with how, how well we've done that. And I think one of the things that's really important is that the use of artificial intelligence is going to enable us to do this mission better than, than uh, it has in the past. Um, and so I lead Google AI, which is a collection of research teams that are working to make progress on solving artificial intelligence problems. And I'd like to just give you a, a survey of some of the work that we're doing and also some of the work that we've seen in the world that we think is really kind of impactful. And then uh, I will sort of hopefully um, just give you a sense. So one of the things that has happened in the last sort of six or eight or 10 years is that uh, an artificial intelligence technique, a uh, machine learning technique called deep learning, which actually was the techniques were developed about 35 or 40 years ago, has sort of made a big comeback and has started to have real world impact on solving a bunch of difficult artificial intelligence problems. And the interesting thing is these techniques are 35 or 40 years old. And what we lacked at that time was we could make them work on very small problems, but we couldn't make them work on very large scale problems, on real world problems. And then starting about eight or 10 years ago, we finally started to have enough computational power to make these approaches work for real problems. And so just to give you some examples of the kinds of problems we can solve with deep learning, um, one way to think about a deep learning uh, machine learning system is it takes in some input and it produces output that's different than the input and is something useful and extracted or transformed from that input. So you can take in a picture of something and then produce a prediction of what is uh, in that picture. Here we have a, you know, a bunch of pixel values, red, green, and blue values of the, of the image, and we can predict that that's a leopard given enough training data. We can also take in audio waveforms, so a recording of sound and produce a transcript of what is being said in that with enough training data of the input audio and then transcripts of what is being said. How cold is it outside? Or maybe how rainy is it outside today? Um, we can take in text in one language, how are you, and produce the output as a translated version of that text. Bonjour, comment allez-vous? We can even do more complex things like take in pixels and instead of predicting just a category, we can actually write a small sentence, a short, simple sentence about what is in that image, a cheetah lying on top of a car, which is not something you see every day. Um, and these, these problems, particularly in computer vision, uh, have really made a lot of progress in the last uh, six or seven years. So just to give you a sense, Stanford University runs a contest every year called the ImageNet Challenge, where you're given a million images and a thousand different categories to train a machine learning model on. And then you're given a bunch of other images and you have to predict which of the, lot, which of the thousand categories is in that image. And in 2011, before people used deep learning models, the winning entry that year got 26% error. And we know that human error on this problem is not zero, it's about 5% because the thousand categories are actually pretty difficult. There's about 40 different breeds of dogs in there that you have to be able to distinguish and, and so on. Um, and in 2016, the winner got 3% error, right? So we've gone from basically computers not being able to see very well to now computers can actually see and do interesting things with the analysis and results of being able to understand what is in an image or what is in a video. And I think you've seen today some of the examples that use computer vision about how those kinds of approaches, the fact that you can now identify uh, you know, whether that's duckweed or not, uh, things like that, enable you to then uh, take action in the world based on the, 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 those images. So one of the things that we, we've been trying to do is support uh, different uses of uh, machine learning and AI to improve uh, social problems that we see in the world. How can we have world positive impact 
in some of the problems we work on and also to support organizations that uh, sort of are doing interesting things with machine learning around the world. So there's a few different things that we do. One is we do research and engineering on problems within our own research teams to tackle some of these problems that, that we see. And then we also support the ecosystem of organizations around the world doing interesting things in their communities. So let me talk about each of these. Um, one thing that we've been focused on, now that computer vision works so much better than it did even in the relatively recent past, there's a lot of applications for computer vision in healthcare-related problems. And so one of the problems in the world that is a very serious one is a disease called diabetic retinopathy. It's the fastest growing cause of blindness in the world. And there's about 600 million people uh, in 2040 that, will ha that have diabetes and should be screened every year. And then there's about 400 million today. Um, and really, this is a, if you catch this disease in time, it's very treatable and very preventable. But if you don't catch it in time, people will suffer vision loss. And so regular screening, where you go to the doctor and they take a picture of your eye, and then an eye doctor looks at that image and decides, are they seeing signs of, early signs of this disease? And really, they're looking at these images and they're looking for these very slight signs of hemorrhages, as you see on the right-hand image here. And they grade it on a five-point scale, one, two, three, four, or five. And one of the problems is that there aren't enough ophthalmologists in the world to actually screen all the people who should be screened every year. And so in India, for example, alone, there's an estimated shortage of more than 100,000 eye doctors. And so 45% of patients in India suffer vision loss before they're diagnosed. And this is very, very tragic because it's an entirely preventable thing. If you were to do the, screen, the right number of screenings, no, none of these patients would need to suffer vision loss. So it turns out in the same way you can use computer vision to categorize general things, like saying that's a leopard or a car or whatever, you can actually use it and train a similar model, but only on eye images to say, this is an eye image that doesn't show any signs of diabetic retinopathy. This is one that shows moderate di diabetic retinopathy. And train the model in the same way you would. And then you have a model that is actually uh, as effective or perhaps slightly more effective than board-certified ophthalmologist at detecting this, uh, this condition. And this is really important because now you can use this algorithm in ways where you don't have enough eye doctors to do all the screening that you should do. Another problem that we've been focused on is flooding. Uh, you know, flooding, particularly with monsoon seasons in, in uh, India and Bangladesh, are, is a very serious problem. There's about 230 million people around the world affected by flooding every year. And uh, one of the things that can really help with flooding is if you give people early warnings about whether their exact place uh, will be flooded and when and how serious it's going to be. And so one of the things uh, you can do is use satellite imagery to build much more accurate maps of the Earth. And because we have satellite images of the same point on Earth from many different angles, we can use that to assess how high the ground is at every particular point and build very good 3D uh, you know, topographic maps of that. And then use that to detect how water will, will flood uh, when, when waters really rise during a, during a heavy rainstorm. And so this enables us to tell exactly where flooding is going to occur. And then using that information, we can send alerts to people's phones uh, telling them uh, that this uh, particular spot is going to be flooded. In the past, the, the simulations that were done, as you see on the left here, were very coarse grained. And so there's a lot of false positives in the warnings you get because the, the simulations were not really accurate enough to tell you your exact spot is going to be flooded or not. And with uh, the better topographic maps, we're actually able to uh, do a better job and a more accurate job of telling you exactly where, when, and how serious flooding is going to be in, in your uh, community. Um, the other aspect of this is, as you've seen today, people in all across the world see interesting problems in their own communities and want to be able to tackle them. And so one of the things we want to do is help support people's use of machine learning and artificial intelligence to tackle the problems that they see. Because when you're sort of in, on the ground in your community, you often have great insight into real problems that need to be solved. And so 
Uh, one way we've been doing that is we've been open sourcing a lot of the tools that we build for our own machine learning uh, applications and use and research so that everyone in the world can use those tools in the same way that we do. Um, so we've open sourced a project called TensorFlow, which is a very popular now machine learning package uh, that, that many people use and contribute to and also use to solve problems that they see. And then through Google.org, uh, we've been working to support organizations that have identified interesting problems in their community. And uh, we just recently announced the, the winners of the Google AI Impact Challenge that we're supporting uh, collectively with uh, $25 million in funding. And you see the names of the organizations here. I'll, talk, I'll just touch briefly on three of them, which I think are pretty interesting. One is uh, the Fondation Médecins Sans Frontières. Uh, they are uh, helping to detect what sort of antibiotics should be treated for people uh, that, are, that are suffering some sort of infection. Uh, the NYU University in the middle there is supporting, is working with the fire department in New York to build machine learning models that can predict better response times for, for ambulances and other kind of rescue crews. And Makarere University in Uganda at the top there is working on uh, supporting um, uh, better uh, po collection of air pollution monitoring so that they can um, better understand air pollution in, in the local environment there and take action to sort of mitigate uh, air pollution. Um, and the, all the other organizations are doing similarly inspiring and, and pretty impactful things, which is, which is fantastic. I mean, that's what you want is for people to find interesting problems and solve them to make the world a better place. Um, we've been also working with Iridescent for, for a little while. You know, I, I had a really fun time about uh, maybe a year and a half ago where about 30 or 40 of us got together and we tried to come up with ways to explain how machine learning works to small elementary school kids. And so, you know, some of us made posters some of, and explained them. Some of us made little short videos of how speech recognition works and this kind of thing. It was, it was a great day. And I, I think the kind of work that Iridescent does is really nice where they get families involved. I think it's really important and to learn with your kids and to tackle problems that none of you know how to solve, but collectively you can all work on. You often learn a lot in that kind of work. And so we're actually thrilled uh, to announce that we're going to be providing $500,000 in funding to Iridescent to continue the kinds of programs like the AI Family Challenge that you see here today. And Thank you. And so uh, I, I think they do great work, and we, we encourage them to keep it up. And um, one of the things uh, that we've been uh, doing as an organization, as we start to use machine learning and AI and more of our products and applications is think carefully about how we want to approach which problems we want to tackle with, with AI and machine learning. And last year we published a set of principles by which we think about uh, potential uses of machine learning. And I think it's really, really good that we publish these openly because as machine learning is used in more places in the world, we want other people to be thinking about some of these issues. They may not come to the same exact set of principles, but I think publishing ours can help stimulate conversation in this. You know, I think uh, in, in particular, a lot of the work that you've seen today here is really aspiring to the, the first two, you know, uh, be socially beneficial. I think that's really, really important. And, uh, you know, we've been doing a lot of work on avoiding and creating and reinforcing unfair bias, which I think is another really important aspect of, of using AI in the world. Um, so, uh, with that, uh, you know, I think one of the great things about machine learning and AI is the impact it's really having on the world in so many different disciplines. It's not just something that is working to solve narrow computer science problems. It's actually working on a wide variety of societally important problems like healthcare, flood detection, uh, you know, the bullying detection. You saw two projects today about that. I think these are all really, really important issues and I, I'm excited. We live in great times. Uh, we can all make the world better through technology. Thank you.